Do you need a landscaping job tackled? Keen Landscaping is a family-owned and operated full-service landscaping company based in Dallas, Texas. Anything from property restoration and tree pruning or removal to landscape design, construction, and installation, Keen covers it all. They're also the official landscape company of the Dallas Stars. Learn more at KeenLandscaping.com. Again, that's K-E-A-N-E Landscaping.com. Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keene, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now here's your host, Parker Keene. All right, so we're back with another episode of Parker's MMA Show, episode number 48 here. Billy, we've got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, we got... To recap the Tyron Woodley Colby Covington fight, talk about our new favorite Chesnian, uh, Michael Chandler in the UFC, and then we're going to preview this week's fight card. So, um, without further ado, let's get into it. As always, like, subscribe, share, do all the good stuff. Billy, lead us off. Let's go. Did we just watch the best fight night in COVID history, Parker? Be honest. I mean, did we just watch it? Might be. <laughs> that may be the best fight night ever. That was an awesome card from start to finish. It was freaking awesome. I, I enjoyed every bit of it. You know, I have a special place in my heart for the Hooker versus Poirier fight night card. But at the end of the day, like, you look at this pound for pound. I mean, this guy delivered, man. I mean, I think Dana's fudging the numbers on 1 million unique ESPN Plus viewers. But I think this thing was heavily watched. I think it was heavily enjoyed. I had a lot of fun watching this fight night. So, Parker, let's get into the main event. Let's give the people what they want. Let's do it. Colby, Chaos Covington, back in action against his arch nemesis, Tyron Woodley. Billy, what did you make of the fight after, what, two to three years in the making? It was boring. To me, I thought it was boring. I hate to be that guy. I thought so, too. Like, I, I, I didn't think it was a great fight. I mean, I will give I will yeah. give Colby Covington credit. Nobody's talking about this because everybody's wrapped up in the post-fight nonsense. But Colby Covington mm -hmm. kicked better in this fight than he's ever kicked before in any previous fight. I think he broke Tyron Woodley's yeah. rib with a body shot. Um, Tyron Woodley's looked the same over the past three fights now. Basically 15 rounds of just utter non-activity. Um, number one, Tyron Woodley fan still in my tie dye shirt. Um, and I'm devastated watching what was once the greatest welterweight on the planet look like he's never been in a cage before. I mean, Parker, what did you think? I agree. I, I think it was probably the most anticlimactic ending we could have had to this rivalry. This was three years in the making and probably three years too late. You know, I, I think both you and I both agree that. Whatever happened to Tyron Woodley, he got old overnight, and he just doesn't have it anymore. He can't pull the trigger. He can't explode in, in bursts like he used to. He just doesn't seem like he wants to be in there. And I, I text you during the fight. I, I thought when he got poked in the eye, I thought he was – I really, really thought he was going to ask out of the fight. I heard him talking to the doctor, and I think he said – you know, is my eye, is the inside of my eye scratched or something? And I, I thought he was going to look for a way out. I really did. And then um, the way it ended, it's just like, yeah, Colby dominated him. He did. But just to end a rivalry like that, I was I was honestly, I was let down. I really but was. But did Colby look good? Like, do, do any of us sit there and think, like, Colby looked good? Like, I thought Colby looked great against Robbie Lawler. I thought he looked great against Rafael Dos Anjos. I even thought he looked good in a fight that he lost against Kamaru Usman. I don't think he looked good. He was had his lowest output since 2011. I thought he played it very safe against a guy who I didn't feel like wanted to yeah. be there. I mean, it was just not a great fight. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to discredit Colby, right? Colby fought the fight he needed to fight to win, right? He won the fight. He did everything he needed to do. He got Tyron on the fence. Yeah. He pressed him up against it. His clinch work was good. The, t the takedown in the first round was a great timing takedown. But 
at the end of the day, you're talking about a guy in Tyron Woodley at this point who has had 15 rounds of virtual non-activity. A guy who doesn't look like he wants to fight and a guy whose physical gifts are carrying him to the finish line. I mean, Tyron Woodley is one of the most physically gifted welterweights of all time. His strength is great. His cardio is great. His explosive power is great. And that has carried him to the finish line. He has not looked good as a fighter. He has not looked like a guy who game planned, who wanted to be there, who wanted to get into the brawl, who wanted to exchange. Like at no point did I sit there and think, wow, Tyron Woodley looks like even glimpses of the Tyron Woodley of old. What did you think about that? The the first round, I don't know. The first round, he looked like he was wanting to explode. It's just like, his body just won't do it or his mind won't do it. I don't know what it is. But for Colby's performance, um, I mean, you're still fighting Tyron Woodley. So you've got to respect the power. It can come out of nowhere. You know, see his high- highlight reel. Not a lot of Tyron Woodley fights are exciting. It just It's that 20 to 30 second burst where he just catches you and then he just explodes and finishes you. So you've, you've got to be aware, aware of that if you're Colby. And I, I think that was his game plan was basically to stay safe. The whole time, uh, put the pressure on Woodley, wear him down, and break him. And I, I really do think Colby was going for that finish, just because he wanted to separate himself from Usman and Gilbert Burns, who you know had similar fights with Tyron but weren't able to finish him. So, I, I, I don't, I'm not hating on Colby that bad. I mean, the bottom line, he got the win. I wish he would have put a stamp on it, and I think we'd be talking a lot differently about Colby and his performance but do you not think he let's, looked let's hesitant move on. let's get into do you not think he looked I thought I, I felt like he was hesitant in there and I don't think honestly it had anything to do with Tyron Woodley I think he took a lot of damage in that Usman fight and that's the first fight I really I, I felt that he took damage in and I, I just felt like he was he was a little gun shy he was not kind of throwing willy-nilly the way that he usually does like if you look at his other fights prior to Usman he goes in and like all credit to Colby on this he has no desire to not get in the cage fight that he's in right he he goes for it and I felt like he was a little gun shy a little hesitant against Tyron and I don't know if it's about the power or about getting kind of TKO'd against Usman but that's that's the feeling I got from Colby was it was a it was a little less output than I'm typically used to from a Colby Covington fight I, I just think you look at it. Tyron Woodley is a different animal. Even this this Tyron Woodley is a different animal than Damian Maya or RDA. I mean, Tyron Woodley can put you out with one shot. So I, I think that's why he was a little hesitant. But he, I don't know, something did seem off. But I, I'm not going to look that much into it. I, I think, like I said, the bottom line, he got the win. He moves on. He's you know in talks for the next title shot. So um, let's get into Woodley a little more. Um, what? What in your mind is going on with Woodley? It's to me, it reminds me exactly of Henan Brow. At one point, you're the best on the planet at your weight class. It's clear. It's obvious. Pound pound for pound, top five fighter in the world. You know, I think Henan Brow was number two when he was on the on at the height of his powers, and T Wood was up there. I too. mean, the guy. I mean, Parker. We were both there in Dallas the night that Tyron Woodley beat Darren Till. That guy looked like the best welterweight of all time. That that performance was so dominant. I mean, he beat Darren Till on the feet. He beat Darren Till on the ground. Uh, he he looked the part. He looked like the guy who, you know, ha- he had talked about when he tore his labrum against Damian Maya and people said it was boring, right? And he came out against Darren Till and it was a whole different man, right? It was it was a bat out of hell. And since that night, we have just not seen that same mentality. We have not seen a Tyron Woodley who looks like he's the best in the world, feels like he's the best in the world. And I think part of it is I think he's breaking down physically. I think he's had a lot of surgeries on a lot of ligaments. And I just think that takes something out of you because you feel it in training, right? You feel it day in and day out of – my punches aren't the same they used to be. My wrestling isn't the same it used to be. And then when you get in that cage on fight night, you're hesitant. You're scared. You're you're a different man than you were. And I think we're just seeing the effects of a 38-year-old man who spent a decade in MMA, who's had a lifetime of high-level wrestling, and it's finally coming coming to roost here where 
This guy just is not the same physically that he once was. Yeah, it's weird because he, he still looks the part. But I, I, I think it's a lot more mental than it is physically with him. It was like the first round, Colby just takes him down like like it's no problem. This is a guy that had, what, 27 takedown defenses against Damian But Maya? it's a timing takedown, like, refused right? to go down. It's a timing takedown. Yeah. So, like, Tyrant's caught off guard by that, and I agree the reflexes aren't there. But I just think, like, when your tendons and your ligaments don't feel the same way that they used to because you've had surgeries on them multiple times, you know that in training. So even though your muscles look the same and your physique looks the same, like you know that your reflexes are not there anymore. And I think that makes you hesitant when you get into the cage. And I think that's what we're seeing with Tyron Woodley and why it's so confusing to all of us when we look at a guy who you're absolutely right. He looks he looks as good as he's ever looked. But at the end of the day, he's a guy who I feel like is scared to throw his punches because he knows his quick twitch muscles are not the same like they once were. Yeah, and, and the men- the mental state of him right now, you go from being one of the best fighters in the world to losing, what, 15 straight rounds? Basically getting shut out in, fif- in your last 15 rounds. And it's like, I-, I don't know how you mentally recover from that. You know, albeit it's the top three fighters in the world right now with Usman, Colby, and Gilbert Burns, but... I mean, he's been shut out in his last three fights, and he's brought nothing to the table. At not one point in any of those three fights did he bring even somewhat of a threat. It's just like he's not there mentally. And I think if he continues down this road, he's going to get hurt, and this is not going to end well for him. And when you look up and down the matchups, and we'll get into this next, I just don't see a safe matchup or a favorable favorable matchup for him in the top 15. Well, here's the guy, so, right? So let's get into this. The guy for to fight Tyron Woodley is Damian Maya. That's the perfect guy, right? They fought before. It's it's a rematch. It's a it's a, a probably a fight that Damian Maya would like to get back. We all yeah. know Damian Maya is not a knockout threat. Right, it's Damian Maya's retirement fight. It's a fight I think Maya could win. It's a fight I think Tyron could win. And like those are two guys that I feel like they both walk out of the cage at the end of that fight and they don't hurt each other. No harm, no foul. We all move on. We all go home happy, right? And so that to me is the number yeah. one fight I want to see, just because it's two guys who I like who are once at the top of the sport and they're kind of contemporaries. I mean, Tyron's thirty eight years old, like. It's just not there yeah. anymore. I agree. I I don't want to see him fight anyone in the top ten. Um, the only people I had in mind, Damian Maya, I like uh, Wonder Boy Thompson. They've got. I'm history. scared of I that. I'm scared Tyron I, gets knocked I, out. Yeah, I don't. Wonder Boy still got it from all from all that I've seen. I mean, yeah. he just beat Vincente Luque in his last fight in a in a striking brawl. I think Wonder Boy still got it. Yeah. Yeah, Cowboy or maybe Robbie Lawler. Outside of that, I mean, you you look at 15 going to one. You've got Kamzad at 15. I think he destroys Tyron Woodley right now. Neil Magny, I think, absolutely destroys Tyron Woodley. Um, RDA is kind of an old guy fight. Do you really want to see that? I, I just don't want to see that. No. Like I think I think my worry with RDA, RDA is very willing to throw elbows in the clinch, right? You want to see Tyron Woodley's yeah. face all cut up? Like I, yeah. I just I'd rather just see the Damian Maya fight and have both of those guys right off into the sunset and we'll call it a day. Yeah. That's the safest for probably both guys. I we'll get into this later, but I don't want to see Damian Maya fight Kamzat at all. Period. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see him retired by this fucking crazy Chesnian. I just don't want to see it. So, um, yeah, for Woodley, man, I if he doesn't fight either Robbie Lawler or Damian Maya, I think he just needs to hang it up. He's got – I don't think he has any fight left in him. I think he's just shot. He's done everything he needs to do. At this point, I mean, basically all you're doing is taking away from your legacy. And he's got the if, TMZ if more, job. More, he's yeah. got the fight night analyst yeah. you know like this guy has a career after fighting tyron woodley is a great individual human being he just is he's very yeah. smart about the game you know he he understands how to set all these things up he's he's got a good business just move on yeah. like 
It's okay. He's 38 years old. People don't realize this because he looks good, right? Well, and I think what he's the oldest um, middleweight champion in middleweight history. Welterweight, sorry. He's the oldest one to hold it. I mean, he's a guy that got started in his career late. So, I mean, I don't. I think he's done everything he needs to do in the sport. I don't. I don't see any reason for him to take any more fights. You know, especially people in the top ten. It's just not worth it for your legacy. And there's nothing. You're not getting back to the title. You're not beating Gilbert Burns. You're not beating Colby Covington. You're not beating Usman. So if you're if it's not a money thing and you're not gonna get the belt back, uh, what's the point? I just bro, I don't, I don't think it. you're beating Jeff. But he Neal. says he's. I don't think I think Jeff Neal wipes the floor no, with Tyron. There's Woodley. no way. Yeah, there's no chance. Um, all right, so I think you and I are on the same page here. But if Woodley does decide to retire, in your mind, what is his legacy in MMA? I think he's probably the third best welterweight of all time. I think GSP's one, Matt Hughes is two. And I think Tyron's three. And then I have some combo of like Robbie Lawler, Rory McDonald, and Pat Militich kind of rounding out that top five, right? Um, I, I I think Tyron's better than a guy like Johnny Hendricks. I think he's Hendricks is kind of the blueprint of how to sully your legacy as a top welterweight, right? If you think about the way Johnny got beat up at the end of his career, I don't see any way that he gets wins that improve his legacy. I just don't see it. And I, I don't I think Usman might end up passing Tyron when all is said and done, but I just don't see a way that Tyron kind of improves that and I would just like to see him right off in the sunset because I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think he's one of the best welterweights to ever do the damn thing and his highlight reel is unbelievable and I just like to see him kind of move on. I do too, and I, I rank him right where you do. I have GSP, the clear cut number one, Matt Hughes, number two, um, Tyron and Robbie Lawler. You know, Robbie in his prime. I, I see those guys pretty close, um, just from how savage Robbie was in his prime at the height of his powers. And then Tyron's got four title defenses, um, one of the best runs in welterweight history. So yeah, I, I'd slot him at three or four. Um, but for Colby. We talked about it briefly already, but um, how do you think Colby looked in his return after getting TKO by by uh, Usman? I mean, he's a great fighter, right? And I don't want anyone to think that I don't yeah. think Colby Covington is a great fighter, even though I I don't agree with kind of his outside the cage persona, and I don't think it's actually a good way to promote him. Like, I do think he's a great, great MMA fighter, and I think this was not a great performance by him. And like, I get that it's Tyron yeah. Woodley. Like, I totally. I understand that. I understand being afraid of the right hand. You know, I, I just thought he looked gun shy in there. And I think in order for Colby to beat mm-hmm. elite welterweights, his his best quality as a fighter is he's not afraid. He'll stick his nose in there. He'll press you against the fence. He'll hit you with a million punches. That's Colby's game, right? He walks right up into the danger zone and... And he clinches you and tries to take you down and tries to hit you with punches over and over and over again and wear you down. And, like, I didn't see that from Colby in the Woodley fight the way I've seen it in the past. And I just think if he's going to go up against the Gilbert Burns or the Usmans or even the Masvidals of the world, he's going to need to be better than that. And it doesn't. it's not that he's not a top five welterweight, but... In order to beat those guys, you need to be better than what he showed against Tyron Woodley, in my opinion. I, I think also for Colby, he may look at it like, hey, I took a lot of da- damage in that Usman fight. I've got to fight more defensively. I can't be as reckless, especially with these guys. Um, like someone, you know, I, I don't think Usman puts him away if he didn't have that broken jaw, obviously. But um, people like George Masvidal, if he fights reckless like that, because he will, he will throw just kind of. I mean, he took a lot of damage in that Maya may... fight. A lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah, but he he's one of those guys. He's a volume guy. He may hit you with you know sixty percent of the punches, and he's throwing them at thirty percent. You know, he's he's just trying to overwhelm you, wear you down, grind you out. But I, I think he he maybe learned something from that Usman fight. He can't take damage against top five guys like this because he's going to get hurt, and that's not sustainable. You know, especially if he plans to get that belt and hold it. He's got to protect himself, and I, that's what I saw. I mean, I saw probably 80% of what I think Colby is. And here's the of. thing. 
I'll yeah. give him credit because yeah. it's a brand new gym, right? He's not an American top team yeah. anymore. And I will say his kicking game has never looked better. He's never thrown more kicks. He's never been more effective with his kicks to the body than in that Tyron Woodley fight. And so if he's able to add that as a new dynamic to his game where you got to worry about Colby Covington at kicking range and at wrestling range, that's a new dynamic that could push him over the edge. I'll absolutely give him credit for that because that is hard to do to become devastating at those two ranges so I, I was definitely impressed by the kicks but I got to see more output from Colby because we know he's not he's not got one he doesn't have one punch power he doesn't have amazing wrestling in the sense that he's just going to take everyone down like Khabib he doesn't have great submission skills he's got to win with volume and I've got to see more of it against the elite welterweights yeah, and I do feel like he he probably felt like he could cruise to a victory against Tyron and not take any damage. I th I think he steps it up a notch if he's fighting Gilbert, Jorge, or Leon Edwards or Usman. So we'll see. Um, yeah, but and you got to also think with Colby too. He carries so much pressure into these fights with how much shit he talks and how dug in he is on the you know MAGA fighter and calling BLM terrorist and stuff like that. I mean. He's got – I think he he can't go in there and get starched because if he does that, he's going to look like a total asshole. And they're going to play it on Sports Center for the rest for of his life, yeah. right? Yeah, over and over and over again. So, I mean, he puts – you know, he puts that on his own shoulders, but that's something I think factors into his mind too. It's like, hey, at the end of the day, I just got to win. So, I, I think he did that, and he'll get better. You know, he'll be back stronger. But – um. Yeah, welterweight's looking good right now. So let, let's get into the rankings. Where, Who are your top five at welterweight right so now? So my top five, um, Kamaru Usman, number one. He's earned it. He's the best welterweight on the planet. Gilbert Burns is number two. I think he's also earned it. I have Jorge Masvidal, number three. I, I still rank him above Colby. I just, I, I'm just i more afraid of him in the cage than I am of Colby. And I have Colby four. And then I have Leon Edwards, five. Um, you know, his win streak is undeniable. He's a well-balanced fighter. But I will say my honorable mention is Wonderboy Thompson. And I, I think it's really hard for me to separate Wonderboy and Leon. I, I think Leon really hasn't fought a top five guy yet. And Wonderboy has. And it, it's just hard for me to separate. Who do you have? Um, I'm going to go Usman, Burns, Colby. Jorge, Leon, and then I'd put Wonder Boy right out, out of there. I just with Leon, he just keeps getting fucked. No one wants to fight him. He can't. The dude can't get a fight. Jorge's not. Wonder gonna fight Boy's him. gonna fight Colby's him. Wonder Boy wants him. to fight him, and that's a good yeah, fight. No. Yeah, that's a great. That's a stylistically great fight. But I just, what does that do for Leon? If he wins, that doesn't put him next in line for the title. Colby, Colby or Jorge are going to get the title next. So he's he's kind of in a shit spot, um, honestly. But, yeah, I think we're we're good there on the rankings. So um, for Colby, where do you think he goes from it's, here? We just talked about it, right? It, it's got to be Jorge. It has to be Jorge. Yeah, I agree. Like, that's the fight. That's Those are the guys who – there's heat there. There's a story there. I mean, what is not to like about Jorge Masvidal against Colby Covington, right? What's not to like? I agree. I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. 100%. Um, if you're the UFC, how do you match match these guys up? Because obviously they've talked about Nate and Jorge, the second match. You've got Connor versus Nate, too, lingering out there. You've got Colby versus Jorge. So... For all these guys, the guys I just mentioned, Colby, Usman, um, Jorge, Connor, Nate, how do you book these guys in the next well, six Usman, months? Well, Usman should fight Gilbert Burns in December, and I think that's kind of being right. talked about behind closed doors. You know, I think that's you know I'm a big advocate for, for the Nate Diaz, Connor McGregor trilogy, and I think it's a perfect fight, and I think yeah. they could do it at 170. I, I, I really think they could do it at 170. And then... Jorge yeah, versus too. Colby is the fight. I think it's the fight. I think Jorge yeah. versus Colby is a bigger fight than Jorge versus Nate too. There's my hot take for the day. No, I I think I agree with that. 
I really do. I, I think Nate versus Connor is a bigger fight than that. But outside, I think that's one of the biggest fights you can make right now is Colby versus Jorge. I really do. I think even with Connor versus Khabib or Connor versus Nate, I think that's a big, big fight. I really do. Um, especially if they can promote it right. If they can promote it right, that's a huge fight. Because this, this Woodley Colby fight, there is zero because promotion. they couldn't touch the After politics. All this they couldn't touch the politics. Yeah. And like, I get it from the yeah. UFC's perspective, but here's the thing with Jorge Colby, it's legitimate bad blood with no politics. And that is the perfect thing for a fight promoter. You're not alienating anyone, right? Like, the, like Jorge and Colby will go at each other personally. It won't be about Donald Trump. It won't be about Black Lives Matter. It will be about I hate you personally. And that is perfect for a fight promoter. All right. I'm going to mention this because I just read your comment and I think you're a moron. The Donald Trump call was not fake. It's not fake news, Billy. What are you talking about? Very convenient. What are you talking about? Very convenient. Conspiracy Bill has his tinfoil hat on. Very convenient for me. (laughs) Oh, my God. You're living in La La Land again. That was it was cool. Politics aside, it was cool to get a a call during an interview from an active president. That that's big. Allegedly. I, I thought that was cool. No, that was real. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to some other fights outside of this fight, the uh, fight night card. Um, outside of the main event, what was your favorite fight? I mean, I, I feel like this is such a dark horse, hardcore pick, but Mackenzie Dern, Randa Marcos was such a weird, wild fight. Like, if anyone hasn't seen that, I highly recommend you go watch it. Mackenzie Dern throws a high kick misses completely, falls to the ground, and Randa Marcos goes right into her guard to get submitted via armbar. It was so weird and so wacky, and I love Mackenzie Dern's jiu-jitsu. It, I loved it. I loved that fight. What did you think? She She's a, she's a problem at 115. I really think she's going to be an issue for these girls. Um, for me, it was the Kamzat show. Let's be real, Billy. The Kamzat show is here. He's just smashing people. Um, I don't. It was impressive. We we know we talked about Gerald Mershot um, last week. You know we we think he's a tough. He's tough a tough guy. dude. Um, and for Kamzat to go, yeah, for Kamzat to go in there and starch him in 17 seconds with one punch, I, I think that's the arrival of this guy. And from now on, he's getting top 15 fights, and we're going to see what he's really made of. But uh, that was a big win and a big statement for him. Um, and then also Johnny Walker. What um, a weird fight. We'll talk about this. It was a weird, weird fight. He gets stunned, what, twice? And then comes back and knocks the dude out with these vicious elbows. But um, I don't know. Johnny Walker, to me, is still weird. Like, I still don't know what Johnny Walker is about. Like, I, I don't I – don't, know if I saw a huge improvement from him switching over to um, John Kavanaugh as his camp. It's just, he's a weird dude and a weird guy to read, but he got a win. And I, I think that's the most important thing probably. And now I think he's calling out uh, Anthony Smith. So um, yeah, those two were good. Um, all right. Out of this event, whose stock do you think fell the most? I got to say, I, I, I kind of hate saying this, like it hurts me, but it's got to be Cowboy Cerrone. I thought it was even worse. Woodley has lost now to the, basically what we believe is t- three of the top four guys at welterweight, right? Cowboy Cerrone looked very bad to me against a guy who's kind of middle of the road at, at welterweight. And I think I'm being generous about Nico Price, like basically an action fighter. Like, I, I mean, is it time to kind of hit the old dusty trail for the Cowboy? I, it's so hard to watch cowboy fights now. I'm just like on the edge of my seat thinking he's going to get knocked out with every punch. Five straight fights, no wins. So, Five straight. He just seems he seems so frail. He's hit, he's to to his credit, he made that a competitive fight. That first round, he got the doors blown off of him. I was like I was so nervous that he was just going to get viciously knocked out, but he finds a way to hang in there. But yeah, I, I I think he's over the hump, and I I am kind of in the same boat I am with Tyron. It's like, who do you book him 
against. At least Tyron's losing a lot of old top guys five in these guys. Divisions. I mean, look, I love watching Nico Price <laughs> fight. No disrespect to the hybrid yeah. because I love watching that guy fight. But Cowboy Cerrone's kind of losing to like middle of the road guys. Yeah, but he's putting on fights. Tyron's not doing anything. Tyron's just in there taking a beating. So Cowboy's still fighting back, and I I think he's got some something left in the tank. I just don't know. Who do you book him up against? I mean, at Nico this stage, Price you're not again? booking any of these guys against. Yeah, I don't know. Mike Perry? Clay Guida? Like I mean, yeah, I, I want to see. I, I do want to see Cowboy take on, like, some old guy fights. Like, you and I have talked about this before. Clay Guida, Diego Sanchez. Who else is hanging around? Um, is BJ, BJ still around? <laughs> comes out of retirement. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Nate Diaz. Nick Diaz. Nick Diaz Nick against Diaz Cowboy Cerrone Cowboy is, is a actually a great fight. fight. I'm totally down for that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to see him fighting the Kamzats or the Hell no. Jeff Neals. Or I even Nico. think the McGregor yeah. fight was a like, bad idea. Like it. Yeah, that was a terrible idea. I, I don't know. This is... It's not good. It, for Cowboy, you know he's going to go out swinging. And Dana actually came out and said, hey, I, I think it's about time to have a conversation with Cowboy. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I, I think it's probably – he's probably got two or three left at most. Um, but, yeah, it's just a matchup thing. Like, I don't know who you Here's the to problem, Park. Everyone's killers in these divisions. You let Cowboy go if you're – like, I agree. There's no, There's not a lot of guys left in the UFC for Cowboy to fight. But if you let him go, you know Bare Knuckle FC is coming calling. You know it's happening. Bellator would do it too. Anyone would take Cowboy. Cowboy's a big name. Cowboy's a really big name. He could do the the, the freaking uh, old guy circuit at Bellator. And I don't know. He could fight Leota Machida. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's... I, don't know, I feel bad for Cowboy because I know he's not going to want to hang it up. Hey, but it, the end they're going to have him fighting Miles Jury in Thackerville, Oklahoma, by the end of the year. All right, Billy, let's get into our new favorite fighter here, the uh, Chesnian Wolf, Kamzat Chimaya. You got it. Is that pretty good pronunciation? The, the problem is I haven't corrected you yet, but I will now. The word is Chechnian. Chech Chechnian Chechnian. Bingo. All right. All right. That would make that would make Ramzat proud. So um <laughs> all right. Three performances in a row. Three three great performances. I mean, what are your thoughts on this guy coming off a seventeen second knockout of Mershaw? So what I said to you is like let's pump the brakes on this guy prior to the fight, right? I said, look, we've seen this before, which we have, and knocking Gerald Mearshart out the way that he did is by far his most impressive win. I think we can both agree on that, right? Um, what I will say is, don't forget, it was, what, a month ago, two months ago, we were talking about Edmund Shabazian, 22-year-old, knocking everybody out in the first round. I'm just saying... Look, we've seen we've seen this before. This guy's nine and zero. I'm not saying he's not great. He could absolutely be great, and like what we've seen is certainly impressive. But I am just I'm afraid to get hurt again. I've seen this hype train too many times. What do you think? Yeah, um, I I think it's just how fast everything's happened. I think what's three wins in sixty six days. He fought. What was it? The fastest turnaround time in UFC history. Wait, 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 wait. Let's let's back that up because Hoist Gracie did this in like two nights. Okay, yeah, I saw I saw Big John, and he's uh, right. Said that. Don't forget about the old guys in the modern era. We're a lot softer than than we were in 1993. The dude's taken what three punches in three? No, it's super impressive. It's super impressive. Yeah, it's it's crazy. The thing that worries me is. This is six minutes of data we've got on this guy. And like you said, you and I were were uh, bowing down to Edmund Shabazian a couple months ago before he got humbled by um, Derek Brunson. So, yeah, I, I think this next fight, he's going to get a top 15 guy. And 
that's going to answer a lot of questions. I don't think he's going to go in there and starch Damian Maya in 10 seconds or starch Neil Magny in 10 seconds. So um, we'll see. I, I think it's a little early to be saying he's the next John Jones. I heard people saying that this week. This guy's the next John Jones. He's the next Conor McGregor. I'm like, ah, pump the brakes just a little bit, please. But uh, but here's yeah, here's what so, I will say. Like, Conor McGregor did this. John Jones did this. So for all the people who say that those people are overrated, remember this moment, right? Because those guys did that and then went on to become UFC double champion, UFC longest reigning light heavyweight champion, undefeated, right? Like, whenever I hear the the Connor slander, the John Jones slander, blah, 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 and, like, I look at a guy like Chimaev, who is that, he is very good, right? But... Remember that those guys not only rode the hype train to this point, they also beat the champion like that. Conor McGregor beat Jose Aldo like that. So, like, I I just hope the people who love watching Kamzat remember how good Conor was on his ride to the top. The buzz does feel similar to, like, the early days of Conor McGregor, yes, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, like... Look, if he's able to rack up two or three more of these big knockouts, that is what Connor did. That is what Anderson Silva did. Like, these guys are special for that reason, and you almost don't realize it until they get to the top. But at the same time, there are the Edmund Shabazians who don't, or dare I say it, Sugar Sean O'Malley, who don't quite get How there. How dare you? How dare you? He'll be there. Sugar Sean will be there. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. That, but the buzz and the hype around this guy, and I think it's because he's done it so quick, and if he can put two to three more wins together by the end of the year, everyone's going to be on the freaking Cosmoc train. So, um, yeah, very, very impressive last two months for him. But um, that leads me to my next question. Who would you like to see him matched up with next? If I have my choice, I'd like to see him stay at 185, and I'd like to see him to fight the Italian dream, Marvin Vittori. I think it's like two guys. It's like a hornet's nest, right? It's these two guys who are so angry, so buzzing, so full of energy. I just want to see them go at it and have it explode in the cage. I will say if he wants to go to 170, I like the Neil Magny fight. That's the guy I would match him up against. But Marvin Vittori, that's my number one choice for Kamzat's next fight. And I think it could be a main event of a fight night. No problem. I agree. I middleweight. I, I went Marvin Vittori. He's at number fourteen. Kamzat's at fifteen. Um, if they want to sacrifice Chris Weidman oh, to him, don't do that. I could see don't Dana do that. doing that. But I, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to see that. that. That's similar to how I feel about Damian Maya. I don't want to see Damian Maya sacrificed. I want Damian Maya to go out with a nice old guy fight, cowboy Tyron or, Woodley or Tyron Woodley. Yeah. Um, at welterweight, yeah, I think you're right. I think the fights to make are Neil Magny or Jeff Neal. Both of those guys I'd be down with. Uh, Jeff Neal, I think it what was his last fight, Platinum Perry, that he viciously uh, knocked Bilal him out Muhammad, right? Oh, he fought him after. But okay. the thing about um, the thing about so Neal yeah, is he with... just got out for I think kidney surgery, so I don't know when Jeff Neal's going to fight again. Um, but. You know, and I'd like to see Kamzat kind of ride the wave. Like we talked about two weeks ago with Leon Edwards, this guy's got to take advantage of the hype right now. He's got to go. He's got to get a fight as soon as possible. You know, a, a, another one that's kind of flying under the radar that's an awesome matchup is Kevin Holland versus Kamzat. Oh, love it. Love it. Kamzat did, Kamzat did, did while everyone was calling Colby Covington racist, Kamzat did refer to Kevin Holland as the help. So, uh, that one, that one flew under the radar, but that's a great, great fight. That's a crazy fight. And those guys are, what, got to be similar ranked. Um, Kevin Holland coming off a win. But, yeah, that's an awesome fight too. But um, Imagine that press conference. Yeah, I imagine this dude's, this dude's turning around in less than a month and a half. For sure, Kamzat's fighting again on Fight Island. No, I think he's going to fight in Las Vegas. So, I, think he's, I think Dana wants to keep him at the PI. Is he? Does he? Okay. Uh, all right. So we want to, we're going to play a little game here for Michael Chandler and Kamzat. But um, I want to run down the top ten 
and see what you think and see kind of where we think this guy can slide in right away and see where he's at currently. We'll, we'll probably do this after his next fight as well. But um, I'm going to start at the top, and you say what you think. And I'll say what I think. I think we're going to agree on a lot of these. But um, all right, 185, do we think Kamzat could beat these guys? Number one, Israel Adesanya. No chance. Yeah, me too. No chance. Um, Iz- Izzy's on another level when it comes to striking. Um, number two, Rob Whitaker. I so I'm this is controversial, but I actually think Rob is a little chinny, and I think Kamzat has big time power. So that would be my one caveat there. You're crazy. Rob Whitaker's not getting beat by Kamzat right now. Um, I got Rob Whitaker all the way. Uh, all right, Paulo Costa. You and I are not gonna agree on a couple of these. I think Paulo Costa mauls Kamzat Chimaev. I think he absolutely beats the crap out of him. I think he's too big, too strong. Like, I think he just comes forward and just whacks him into oblivion. I think Kamzat could take him down and beat the shit out of him and wear him out. If Kamzat hits him with 300 ground strikes, strikes the first round, Paulo's going to be dead. Paulo, also, Paulo's like an upper level jujitsu belt. I don't think, I don't think he's Paulo like a brown Costa's belt. getting take, taken down like that. Oh, I don't know. This dude's scary, but still, there's a lot of unknown about him. Uh, Paulo Costa is scary. Eh, he's he's going to get exploited this weekend. We'll get into this. Um, all right, Jared Cannonier. I think you and I are on the same page here. Cannonier to me is like if Paulo Costa was an even better grappler. I actually don't think that fight is close. I think Cannonier is very, very good and beats up Chimaev. Too many crystals on his side. I think he's still the dark horse, and I think he KOs uh, comes out right now. Right now, Jack Hermanson. Uh, grappling, grappling scrambles would be crazy. I think Hermanson gets him in some weird submission and wins. Yeah, I think it's close, but I think he edges him out right now. Darren Till. Oh, I think I think Kamzat beats the crap out of Darren Till. I think he just takes him down I, and mauls him. <laughs> I do too. I see this as I. The same way I see Connor versus Khabib, I think he just takes him down. And the the difference here is Kamzat holds his own on the on the feet. I mean, he would he would stand and strike with Darren Till, but if he got him to the ground, he would just beat the brakes off of Darren Till. So I'm gonna go. I think he could beat Darren Till. Um, Derek Brunson. I Brunson looked really good to me against Shabazian, and I I think he's kind he of did. like a, a renewed focus. Like I I would not underestimate him. I think he could beat uh, Kamzat. I think that one's close, but that's a big fight because I, I still think even though Derek Brunson beat um, Edmund Shavazian, I still think he's kind of your stepping stone to get to the top five at middleweight right now. So you I, skipped I Yoel. Could... Did we? Yeah. No one's beating Yoel. Let's be. No real. one's beating Yoel. He's Romero. not beating Yoel right now. Yoel's gonna fight till he's fifty. Um, Yoel's gonna fight right, till he's eighty. Gas- <laughs> Kelvin Gastelum. Kelvin, to me, hasn't looked right since the Izzy fight. So I take Kamzat. Yeah, I, I think he knocks out Kelvin. I really do. This dude's got crazy power, too. Uh, Chris Weidman, I, I don't need to see that. Please don't show me that. He looks so ch- He's looks so chinny, right? Like, I don't need to see Chris Weidman against anyone with big power. What about Rory McDonald? You think he takes <laughs> out Rory McDonald? Do you think Rory McDonald ever fights again after the PFL went on hiatus? He should come back to the UFC. Why not? Because it gets Throwing his ass kicked by the whole top five at welterweight, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, he's got the Lord on his side, Billy. All right. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go 170. What about Usman? No chance. Usman's a different level right now. Yeah. I agree. Um I think you and I are on the same page with the top three. I, I don't think he beats anyone in the top three right now. At I at, think uh, I think Colby I think the Colby Covington fight is close. I think Colby's very I hittable. I really don't. I I'm gonna say about the Gilbert Burns Gilbert Burns as well. I'm I think Gilbert Burns has a lot to prove against Usman. I'm not completely convinced that Gilbert Burns is better than Colby Covington. You look at the guys he's beat, Damian Maya, who's 42 years old, and Tyron Woodley, who's a shell of his former self. Uh, Gilbert Burns has a big, big task on his hands December 12th. So 
I'm I'm gonna say I think everyone in the top three beats him. Uh, what about Leon Edwards? I take Leon. I think he's very well balanced. I think he's never really you've never seen Leon take a ton of damage in a fight. He might be the best defensive fighter in that division. So I'm gonna take Leon. And Kamzat might be the only guy to fight Leon. Seriously. No, he, Wonder he Boy may versus jump the, Leon is gonna happen. I know. I know, but if that doesn't happen, I don't think anyone else wants to fight Leon Edwards, and I think Kamzat would definitely take that fight. So um, we could uh, we could hundred percent see that by the end of the year. Um, George Masvidal, I think it looks very similar to the Usman fight, um, but I I just think Jorge's fought and beat better strikers than Kamzat, right? And so like, I think Kamzat could beat him. I think he could hug him. I think he could take him down, but. At the end of the day, I'm going to take Jorge Masvidal. Me too. I got Jorge. Um, Woodley, I think you you and I agree. Kamzat via murder. He'll yeah, bring his I, body back to uh, Ram, Ramdam Kazirov. Ram. <laughs> I butchered that. I butchered, I butchered that one. Um, Wonder Boy? I actually think Wonder Boy wins this pretty handily. I think he's a very bad matchup for Kamzat. He's so good at distance management. I, I just think he can kind of dance around and keep Kamzat at bay. I think stylistically that's an awesome matchup. Stripe, striker versus grappler. Um, I don't know. I, I think Kamzat gets it done against Wonder Boy. Damian Maya, I think we're on the same page here. I think this fight is closer than people think, honestly. I really do. Um, I, I think Damian's I just a different level it. of jujitsu. I just hope that Kamzat doesn't hit him. I could see Damien just pulling guard in this and going for a heel hook. I don't need to see it. I don't need to see Damien. I don't need to see it. I'm not saying I need to see it. Um, Yeah. Um, Okay, this is a fight that I want to see. I I think this this could be his next fight. Michael Chiesa? I love that fight. I really love that fight. That's a great matchup. Um, I actually think Chiesa is really underrated. I think he's better than people realize. I think his his jujitsu is a lot better than people realize, and he could give uh, Kamzat problems. I I really like that matchup. Yeah, that's a great matchup. Um, that's a fifty fifty fight for me. Um, Dos Anjos, I I think Kamzat's just too big for Dos Anjos. Um, I also think RDA I, I, always loses to wrestlers. Always, every time yeah. he fights a wrestler, yeah. he loses. Yeah. All right, so that was our. Uh, breakdown of Kamzat you should probably we'll see him back in action what in a month or so um yeah this dude's he's I'm really really high on Kamzat he's he's definitely stole the show when it comes to the COVID area for sure um so this guy fights more often than people change their socks yeah it's crazy it's crazy so uh let's get into another big topic uh Michael Chandler Michael Chandler was a free agent um, after his last Bellator fight against Benson Henderson, and he inks a deal with the UFC. So what do you think about the Michael Chandler signing, and how much do you think he has left in the tank to make a run at that lightweight title? I think this is the biggest signing since Eddie Alvarez, to be honest. I think it's one of the biggest signings the UFC's made in three to four years. I also think it's three to four years too late. I think around 2016, Michael Chandler could have beaten literally anyone in the division. He could have been the champion. Uh, I think today he's somewhere in, you know, six to 10, right? Like, I still think he's a top 10 lightweight in the world, even in the UFC's stack lightweight division. But I do think it's a little late. I think he's a little past his prime. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, Michael Chandler is a guy that, I don't know, I feel... I, I I compare it to Ben Askren, but it's not the same situation. Um, ben Askren was one dimensional. Michael Chandler can kind of do it all. He's aged a lot better too. The guy's thirty four years old now. He's been in Bellator forever, and he's, he's younger. He's stop- definitely younger yeah. than Askren was. Well, and he's in phenomenal shape. I mean, he's a guy. He's not. I'm not going to say he's quite on Alistair Overeem's level, but he's a guy, an older guy that's continue to evolve and get better and come back strong every time he loses. Um, but I mean, he's been the face of Bellator for his whole career. He's got, he's what a three time Bellator champ. He's got the most stoppages in Bellator history. I do think it's probably two to four years late, but I, I do feel strongly that 
with how explosive this guy is and how powerful he is for this division, even at 34 year old, 34 years old, I think he's going to be competitive with anyone in the top five, may outside of Khabib. I don't like the matchup with him and Khabib. Um, so let's get into it. How who do you want to see him fight first in his UFC debut? Dan Hooker. I, I for me, it's no doubt it's Dan Hooker. I think it's the perfect fight. Um, I, I I just think it's the perfect introduction for him to the UFC and like really test his medal against the guy who nobody denies is in the top ten. What do you think about him being the backup for Khabib versus uh, Gagey? I don't hate it. I mean, I think. You know, first of all, it tells you exactly where the UFC thinks Bellator is because this is a guy who's not even the lightweight champion in Bellator, and he's considered the backup, right, for the UFC's championship fight. So for all the people who hate Bellator and say it's not as good, like the UFC clearly thinks it's just as good. And um, I, I like I like the match. I like the matchup. I think it's I think it's very fair. I think Michael Chandler's a professional who they know will make weight, but I don't need to see him in a title fight right off the bat. Yeah, I just think that would be weird. A weird introduction. You know, if one of those guys fall out, he steps in on a day's notice. I so what is he just he flies to Fight Island and cuts weight and he's ready to go if something happens. He gets paid to cut weight. Yeah, I thought that was strange, but Anyway, um, for me, yeah, I think it's two guys. It's Paul Felder or it's Dan Hooker. Um, Dan Hooker is just coming off that crazy fight with Dustin Poirier. Uh, Paul Felder is kind of, you know, on the verge of retirement. I think he would definitely get up for a fight with a big name like Michael Chandler. So, yeah, I, I think either one of those guys I'd be happy with. And then I'd like to see um, them get the winner of Dustin versus Tony. I really do. And they, I, I hope the UFC – books that fight because that's a phenomenal fight um but yeah that's what i like to see happen so um let's fire through the top 10 here and just kind of see how you think michael chandler would fare against these guys um let's start with khabib i think chandler is basically the poor man's version of khabib i think khabib does everything chandler does just better than he does so I- i'm gonna take khabib i think he's more similar to justin gaethje he's just he's got the wrestling threat you know he's a strong wrestler he's got super super power in his hands um yeah but i just don't think i don't see any way that he gets it done against khabib i really don't um justin gaethje a few years ago i think this is a really competitive fight i just don't think chandler is as durable as gaethje is these days so i think gaethje wins in a brawl yeah i do i i think I'm going to say this probably about the next three guys, Gaethje, Poirier, Ferguson. I think all three of those guys just take – they're very, very close matchups with Michael Chandler, but I think they take him to deep water, and I think they break him. I really do. He's just an older guy. He's got more miles on him. Yeah, that's how I see it going. I, I love the matchup with him and Justin. Um, I like that fight more than Khabib and Justin. But, um, yeah, I, I just think – Justin gets it done. He's a younger version of him. Uh, Dustin Poirier? I think Dustin breaks him. I, I think Dustin I beats everybody except Khabib right now. I, I just think he's he's that good. I really do. I do, too. Um, yeah, like I, I said in my notes, I, Dustin knows how to go to the deep water and knows how to drown you. <laughs> you see his last four to five fights. That dude, you got to put him out. You You got to find a way to put him out or choke him out separate him from his consciousness because that dude is coming for you the entire fight he's a fucking animal and i i would love nothing more to see dustin dustin poirier get back to that title fight um tony ferguson i think that's an absolute war i think it's two guys that are super skilled and a little over the hill um i'm gonna take tony but i'm not i wouldn't be super confident in that i i think that's a really even fun fight with two guys who have very different skill sets yeah, if if they can't make the Dustin Poirier Tony fight, I would I would be hundred percent down for them to book book Chandler against uh, Tony right out of the gates. I think that's a phenomenal fight. I agree with you. I think it's two guys that are kind of over the hill, two guys that take a lot of damage. It would be a super fun fight. Um, Conor McGregor, who knows where Conor's he's not retired. At. Yeah, he's retired, right? Like he's on a yacht, like exposing his junk to you know newly married couples, right? Like. <laughs> I mean, look, here's the thing. I, I really think, even in his prime, I think Chandler could do exactly what Khabib did to Connor. 
I, I just do. I, I think it's I think it's possible. And like I, I I just don't I I think it's a very bad matchup for Connor, honestly. I think it's a bad matchup for Chandler. I think Connor puts him away. I really do. Michael Chandler takes a lot of damage and it takes one shot from Connor to hurt you and put you away. So I'm gonna roll with Connor on that one. Uh Dan Hooker. I love Chandler in that matchup. I think Dan Hooker has shown yeah. that he doesn't have great wrestling, and I think Chandler can kind of just take him to the ground and just beat him up. I agree. I think that's a crazy fight. I think that starts out really, really hot. Then Chandler implements his wrestling and, like you say, takes him down, beats him up, and gets that gets that win for sure. Um, Charles Oliveira? I think Oliveira is the most underrated lightweight on the planet. I, I, I think his striking is much improved. I think his jujitsu is out of this world. I, I just think he can beat Chandler in a lot of places, honestly. So I th- I take Charles Oliveira, but I take Charles Oliveira over a lot of guys on this list. Yeah, he's a wild card to me. I still don't know completely what he's what he's about. I want to see him fight some of these guys in the top five. But I think that's another one that's just like a crazy, crazy war in the beginning. Um, I could definitely see Oliveira catching him in a submission or something. But I, I think Chandler could get that win for sure. Um, Paul Felder? I love that fight. That's probably – I'm with you that that's my second choice if we can't get the Dan Hooker fight. I'm going to take Chandler because of the wrestling, but I, I could see this being a complete toss-up. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a 50-50 fight, and I, I would love to see Felder do it one or two more times. He's one of my favorite fighters on the roster, um, and that's a great fight for Michael fan, Michael Chandler to be introduced to the UFC fans. Um, your guy, Diego Ferreira. I just think his submission skills are so good. Like I'd be so worried about the jujitsu if I'm Chandler. Um, I'd probably take Ferreira, but I could see it going either way again. Yeah. I see Chandler knocking him out. I really do. I, I don't know why I just have it in my head that he knocks him out. Uh, raging Al. I think Michael Chandler dominates raging Al. I don't <laughs> I do even too. think it's a close I think he's fight. Just better. Yeah, I think he's just better everywhere. So, um, all right, so those are our breakdowns for Michael Chandler and Kamzat. Um, let's jump into this weekend's card, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, UFC 253 going down at Fight Island this Saturday. Um, we've got two Snuck championship up on us, huh? fights. It did. It really did. Um, the middleweight belt and the light heavyweight belt are on the line. So let's get into the light heavyweights first. We've got Don Ray. Dom Reyes taking on Jan Blahovic. Um, how do you expect this fight to look? Honestly, I think this is a straight up brawl. I think this is going to be fight of the night. I think Jan Blahovic is going to walk forward the whole time. I think Reyes is going to try and use his kicks and his footwork to kind of dance around the cage. And I just think it's going to end up being two guys who are just throwing at each other the whole time. What do you think? I do. I agree. There's a lot on the line here. Obviously, John vacated the belt after. 10 years of dominance. Both of these guys think they're the best light heavyweight on the planet with John Jones gone. So I agree. I I think this is going to be a war and these guys are going to get after it. And this is really going to establish who our next dominant light heavyweight champion is, I think. So um, give me your pass to victory for Jan. He's got to come straight forward and cut off the cage, right? Dom Reyes loves to fight on the outside. He's got great length with his kicks. So He's trying to get out of the way, you know, throw a couple combos, get out of the way. Jan has to cut that cage off, march forward, and he's got to touch uh, Dom's chin with his right hand because that's going to be the key to the fight if he can get to Dom's chin. I agree. With Jan, he's not a super aggressive fighter. A lot of his fights, he's not just charging in and chasing you. So I think he's going to be patient with it, but I think he's going to try to close that distance. He's going to try to cut the cage and... Get get Dom into bad spots. Get him into boxing range. Um, get him in clinches. He's devastating out of the clinch and in close range. Uh, see the Luke Rockhold fight. See the Corey Anderson fight. Um, the dude's got a lot of power, and it only takes one shot to shut the lights off. So that that's what I think he's got to do. He's just got to kind of be patient let the fight come to him. Um, I think he's going to want to take it into a little later rounds, You know, drag it into the fourth and the fifth and kind of make it an ugly fight. Um, what are your paths to victory for Dom Reyes? I think he's got to throw three to four strike combos. He's really got to utilize the kicks, util- utilize his leg reach, and just get out of the way. 
because he's going to have to pick Jan apart from the outside, wear him down, slow him down. And then when, you know, Jan's hands start to drop in the later rounds when he gets tired, that's when Dom can really go to work. Because if he tries to take him out in the early rounds, I think Jan has way better power. He's way stronger than Dom is. I agree. I, I think mentally Dom can't overlook Jan. I, I feel like Dom thinks... You know, he just went five rounds and beat the best fighter of all time. And I think if he has that mindset, he may overlook Jan and walk onto a bomb. So I, I, I think he needs to respect the power of Jan, stay out of the way, keep his distance, um, use his footwork, don't take any bombs early, um, get on the leg kicks early because Jan Blahovich is very susceptible to leg kicks. Uh, especially in the early rounds, and just anticipate a five five round fight. You know, I, he's not going to go in there and start Jan Blahovich in the first two three minutes. Jan Blahovich has been around forever. To me, yeah. it's legs he's and body champion. early, yeah. and then head hunting in yeah. the later rounds. If you're Dom Reyes, yeah, th- th- this is going to be a wild fight, one hundred percent. This is, I think, it's flying under the radar a little bit, but this is this is a big fight for the light heavyweight division. Um, these two guys, I think they're going to go in there and get after it. So, Billy, give me your prediction. I'm going to take Dom Reyes by decision, but like you said, I think this is a wild fight. I I think it's a it's much more fifty fifty than the odds would say. Um, I, I really like this fight. I'm really excited for it. Um, but I'm going to take Dom Reyes by decision. I just, I think he's the best light heavyweight other than John Jones. I'm going with my guy, Jan Blahovich. I think, uh, KSW, baby, on, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dom's going to walk into one of these big shots and I think Jan's going to put him out. If Jan hurts you, he puts you out. So I'm going with Jan Blahovich, third round knockout. I think the first two rounds are going to be crazy. Um, but I think Jan's going to catch him. I really do. So um, I've got Jan Blahovich as your new lightweight, lightweight champion. So, um, all right, let's get into this next one. This next one's a big one. Uh, middleweight strap on the line. Israel How about Asanya this? taking on... Go ahead. You ready for this? Here's a stat for you. Let's I didn't even it. put this in the show notes because I want to surprise you with it. Okay. Sean El Shadi, shout out. The Athletic. 278 title fights total in the UFC, right? Right. Six of them have been between two undefeated contenders. Four of those six were Ronda Rousey. Only one other time. In UFC history, has it been Lyoto Machida against Rashad Evans, two male contenders, both undefeated, fighting for the belt? This is the second time in UFC history. This is history. Wow. This is an all time matchup. If you don't like MMA, watch this fight. This is unbelievable. I cannot wait to watch Style Bender against Paulo Costa, two stylistically different men, two promotionally yeah. different men, go at it in that cage on Fight Island in Abu Dhabi. That's my soapbox, Parker. How pumped Let's are you go. for this fight? Let's go, Billy. Billy's getting fired up East Coast time. All right, uh, man, I'm pumped. This is The buildup for this has been awesome. I've got everyone texting me about this fight. I've got Leah's... 75 year old uncle texting me about this fight i've got customers texting me about this fight um the ufc espn's done a great job of marketing this fight i think the hype is huge around this fight it feels really really big the card itself is not great outside of the main event and the co-main event but um this feels really big so let's get into it how do you think this fight's gonna look i i'm looking for this fight could go one of two ways to me if, if Israel Adesanya is winning this fight, it is at kickboxing range. It is these two guys standing apart from each other, not touching each other. Israel ripping kicks. Israel using his length. Israel hitting him with jabs. If Costa is able to close that distance and put Israel up against the fence, use his strength, use his additional weight up against Israel Adesanya, he will win this fight. He will be able to put... Israel Adesanya up against the cage, potentially use wrestling, use hooks, use shots to the body, and keep Israel at bay. What do you think? I agree. I totally agree with you. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, 
you hit it spot on. So let, let's dive into these guys. Um, you start first with Costa. What do you think he's got to do to get this win against Stylebender? I mean, the first thing he's got to do, he's going to have to eat strikes. Israel Adesanya is a master technician. You're going to have to eat kicks. You're going to have to eat jabs. You got to take those pawing shots. You got to keep moving forward like nothing happened. You got to get this guy pressed up against the cage. You got to rip your big body shots, potentially get a takedown in the clinch. And you got to make sure that you're beating this guy up and using your power because you're not beating him in a technical kickboxing fight. You got to make this ugly and close and really dirty right in that clinch area. I agree. I, I think uh, Chael said it best. It's like, you know, Paula's got to have that George Foreman mindset. You know, you're going to take three or four shots to land your big shot. And that's just the reality of it. I, I think Israel is just on another level in the striking department. When you look at the their styles and abilities side by side, I mean, Paulo, yes, he's got power. He's got the physique of a Greek goddess, Greek god. <laughs> Sorry, Paulo. Um, but he throws very simple striking. It's got kind of fundamental, you know, Muay Thai kickboxing. Israel's got a lot more to his game. So, um, yeah, I think for Paulo, he's got he's to kind of make this chaotic. He's got to just make it frantic. He's got to rush. He's got to blitz Israel. He's got to hope to catch him. Um, if not, if he can't close the distance and, you know, make it ugly, make it dirty, land dirty boxing shots, hold them up against the fence, I really think Israel's just going to pick him apart, you know, I, but I think that's his only option. I, I don't, I don't see any way that Paulo Costa wins a five round fight against Israel Adesanya. I just don't, I really don't. So, um, yeah, for, what about for style bender? He's got to keep the fight at range. He's got to use his footwork. He's got to use his jab. He's got to wear out the gas tank, make Paolo Costa miss, and make sure that he is able to get Costa's hands down in those later rounds because he's tired, and then use the precision strikes that make Izzy so dangerous. It's going to be a matter of can he play Matador in the first couple rounds, figure Costa out, figure out the timing, and then in the third, fourth, fifth round, come out firing to the point that Costa doesn't know what hit him? I agree. I think round three is going to tell you a lot. You know, we, we saw Costa go three ferocious rounds with Yoel Romero. So I'm, I'm not necessarily worried about his cardio. I think his cardio will hold up with Israel, but I think you're right. I think Israel's got to survive the first, you know, one to two rounds because Costa's going to throw everything at him and try to get him out of there early. He's just got to survive. He's got to be safe. He's got to use his movement. He's got to keep the fight at his range. Um, and then as the fight goes on, Israel Adesanya is very similar to Anderson Silva, Floyd Mayweather. As the fight goes on, he starts to figure you out. Round by round, he figures you out. He catches your timing. Then he starts going to work on his counter strikes, and that's when he's dangerous. He'll make you miss, and then he makes you pay with just precise, clean shots. And I think that's what we're going to see, Billy. I, I think I think it's going to be crazy, the first three rounds. And then I, I think four and five, Israel just starts to figure him out and starts to pick him apart. I just I don't think these guys are on the same planet when it comes to their striking ability. I think, man, style bender's like a fifth degree black belt in striking. And I think your guy Costa's a brown belt, you know, purple brown belt. He's just scary, very, very scary. He's very dangerous. But there's just so many more tools in the shed of style bender. Um, and we've said this, you know, at at nauseum about city kickboxing. There's just something in the water at city kickboxing. These guys have just changed the game when it comes to striking. And I think you're going to see their leader put on a clinic this weekend. Is it prediction time? I think it's go time, Billy. It's prediction time. Who do you got? Let me tell you something, Parker. Last night, I watched my favorite boxing match of all time. 1993. The Atlantic City Boardwalk. Evander Holyfield against George Foreman in the Battle of the Ages. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see on Saturday night. 
I think we're going to see a guy who looks smaller, who looks faster, who looks quicker, who throws more strikes against a guy who looks like an absolute powerhouse that if you took one of his punches, you'd be out for the next week. And you know what? I'm taking the same way that I think George, uh, Evander Holyfield won on that night. Israel Adesanya, but I'm taking him by third round KO. I think he figures out Paulo Costa. I think he wears out the gas tank. I think by the middle of the third round, Costa's got his hands down and he's panting and he's asking to get out of that fight because I think Israel Adesanya is going to put him to sleep. I agree. I, I totally agree with everything you just said. I'm going one round later. I'm going round four KO for Israel Adesanya. And I think he becomes the face of the UFC. I think this is going to be his signature win that puts him to that next level of stardom. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for Israel to put a huge stamp on this fight this weekend. And really, I mean, he's going to be on a rocket ship to superstardom. I, I really do think he's going to pick him apart. And he's going to show just how how he's on another level from all these guys. And I, I do I do think when it's all said and done, he's going to be your best middleweight of all time. He may even pass Anderson Silva. And I think you're going to see him fight John Jones, you know, eventually. It's big fights from here on out for Israel Adesanya. But this is a big one this weekend. It's a scary guy that he's fighting, but I just don't think they're on the same level. So I'm going to go with Israel Adesanya. Uh, Billy, now that we... That was crazy. I'm, I'm super hyped about that fight. But um, what is your favorite fight outside of the championship fights? You know, you knew what fight I was going to pick the moment this question showed up. My man. What's on your shirt? What's on your shirt? Is that a school of self-awareness shirt? My man, Diego Sanchez, <laughs> doing stretches in the airport, riding on the, on the wing of the plane on the way to Fight Island. Check the Parker's MMA show Twitter. This guy is ready to go against Jake Matthews. I don't care that Josh Fabia is in his corner. I don't care what kind of aura he's got going. Diego Sanchez is coming to Fight Island for a victory, and I couldn't be more excited. Who is your favorite fight? Why is Stefan Bonner in his corner now? <laughs> Who cares? What is going they on did there? DMT together in like 2003. That's why. All right. Well,. Everyone tune in for that fight. D definitely don't miss that fight. You're going to see some bizarre shit with our guy, the GOAT, Diego Sanchez. Um, I don't know. For me, I like that fight. Anytime Diego Sanchez fights, you got to tune in. It's must-watch TV, even in his bizarre, shamanistic yoga phase of his life. Um, I've got Kai Kara France versus uh, Brandon Roval. Great Ro fight. Roval. That's a great fight. Um, flyweight top 10 fight. Uh, Kai Kara France, member of the city kickboxing team. I think this is just going to be an explosive, fast-paced, really, really fun flyweight fight. So watch out for that. Um, anything else, Billy, you want to add to that card? Shout out my guy, Mean Hakeem. Shout out my guy, John Anik, new friend of the show. I'm, I'm hyped, Parker. I'm ready to go, buddy. I, I can't wait for Saturday night. Let's fire up the pay-per-view, fire up the beers, Gather everybody out, social distancing in the backyard. Let's watch some cage fighting. I can't wait. Fight Island, baby. We're back. We're back. All right, Parker's MMA show coming up on 50 episodes, Billy. We're rocking and rolling here. Um, we'll be back next week. We'll break this down. We'll keep some interviews rolling. Everyone like, subscribe, share, do all that good stuff. Diego Sanchez, the school of what is it called? Self-awareness, baby. Josh Fabian and Diego Sanchez, open invite. Come on the show. Everyone go check it out. Get your mind right for this weekend's card. All right, till next time. Adios, Signing out. Buddy. See you later. All right, bye. Texas Trees is the premier tree care company in the DFW area. Whether you need basic maintenance or specialized services, when it comes to trees, we've got you covered. Pruning, chipping, bracing, and cabling, even root barriers and disease control, we do it all. And if you aren't sure what you need, we have certified arborists on staff to point you in the right direction. Visit us at NorthTexasTrees.net. That's NorthTexasTrees.net. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA Show. 
take a moment to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And visit Parker Keen's MMA show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes. <laughs>